Hello everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play The Life and Suffering of Sir Bronte with me, Alpha Pi Omega, and Rudolf Bronte. So we have probably reached the end of the game, the battle for Anazot. I guess, you know, for us it would be better if we were reading the revolt, but I guess not. <laughs> There's not much to be said about that. The battle for Anazot. The dark void beyond the walls of Anisot is lit by hundreds of lights. Heavy boots thread the soil, armor clanks, halberds gleam, drums beat a lively march. Led by the glow of the torches, the migrant legion approaches the city walls. Are they actually going to attack in the middle of the night? That's damn weird. Gaius Tempest himself leads the legion. It is the Overseer's duty to crush the revolt this very night and pacify the city before news of the incident spread throughout the Empire. If the Overseer's hesitation allows the revolts to last even a few days, it could jeopardize not only his position, but even the fate of the entire province that has been entrusted to him. Before ordering an assault, the Overseer sent a message to the city. Gareth Tempest, my subjects, lay down your arms this instant and open the gate. I know that you have been deceived by the insurgency. You have my word as an Arcanian ruler that I will spare anyone who aids the Legion and turns over the leaders of the revolt. Should you disobey this order from your lawful ruler, none of you will escape disgrace, execution and eternal torment at the foot of the Shining Pillar. But the Overseer's threat only further enraged the rebels. An entire city rebelling against impure rule. Nothing like this has happened for generations. But not even experts in ancient history could have imagined what is happening on the streets of Hanisot at this moment. The decisions you made today have led the entire city to rise up against imperial rule. By nightfall, everyone who has ever suffered from noble tyranny has taken to the streets in support of the last straw. Even those who began the day cowering in terror from the Overseer's wrath have now emerged from their homes and joined their cause. The common sphere has been eclipsed by their rage. They march through the city in droves, ready to dispense their own justice. By sunset, even the most loyal defenders of the Empire have come to realize that all hope is lost. The loyalists have amassed considerable forces at Charmelandida's palace, but they are too late. Hordes of furious covenants stormed their camp, crushing any resistance. Exhausted and demoralized by their futile fight, many defenders of the old order flee mob justice or surrender and accept their death with dignity. The moans of those trampled by the incensed throng can be heard throughout the camp. Abandoned imperial banners are hurled into the fire. Sophia, make way! The crowd grows silent and parts before Sophia. The leader of the revolt is disheveled, her clothes stained with blood, but a predatory smile lingers on her face. She is completely crazy. Here, amidst fire and madness, she has finally found her place in the world. Sophia, just look at your former masters now. Pathetic, ain't they? They thought they could put us in chains again, but they dropped their swords at the first sight of us. They lied to you for centuries, telling you it was your lot to suffer and break your back for them, but look who's suffering now. I give you my word, tonight we're gonna execute anyone who isn't on our side, every single one of them. And then we'll feast among the ruins of the old world. The crowd roars, shaking her weapons in the air. Sophia, not now the only thing that stands between us and the freedom is the legion but we'll take down the Overseer troops just like we took down the Emperor's lackeys here in Anisa. But first we need to get rid of the rest of the enemies and traitors in this camp. Sophia takes a glance around the site of the recent massacre. Her merciless gaze stops at you. Branta. The time has come. This moment will determine your place in history. Except death? <laughs> Oh, that's if we will be the defender of the Empire. Defy Sophia. You refuse to destroy your own city. In despair, you appeal to the crowd, asking them to denounce Sophia and stop the carnage. Take charge of the bloodbath. There can be no mercy for the enemies of the revolt. You will be responsible for dispensing vigilante justice and defending the walls from the Legion. 
stop this water or flee. Okay, so we can either defy her or take charge. Well, that's a hard one. We either defy her and ask the people to make us stop the carnage. We're gonna risk it to defy her. As if oblivious to Sophia's order, you look around you, paralyzed. Fires have blanketed the Anisot in acrid smoke. Noble districts are in flames, as is the chancellery. The temples of the old faith are ablaze, and priests who refuse to join the rebels are burned alive within. The bodies of those executed by firing squad lay in heaps by the walls. The cobblestones are littered with the corpses of those hurled from the windows of their own homes. Yeah, remind me of the French Revolution. What has become of your city? You turn your head slowly and meet Sophia's gaze again. You will not perpetuate this madness. In despair, you address the crowd. Is this really what they want? Fire, blood and murder? They've overthrown the nobles who ruled over them. But who have they chosen to take place, Sophia will only lead them to eternal bloodshed and endless suffering. They have not gathered here to revel in revenge and destruction. For the first time in history, they are in position to lay the foundations for a new world. They have a chance to bring justice to everyone, to establish equality among the estates, to free themselves from the lots. Your voice hoarse, you finish your speech, utterly exhausted by the effort. The crowd is silent, even Sophia is bewildered by her passionate plea. For a moment you see the frightened girl who once lived next door to you, but the leader of the revolt swiftly regains her composure. Brantus a traitor! Get him! The crowd bellows. Traitor! Imperial lab dog! Strong armies grab you. You are surrounded by a horde of furious, blood spattered Wastral fighters. You're finished, Bronte. Execute him. Quick, put him to trial. At Sophia's order, you are forced to your knees. The crowd cheers in but first the anticipation, eager for another execution. The gunmen raise their muskets. Sophia. People of Anisot, this is Rudolf Brante, another enemy of our freedom. We know him as a comrade who fought by our side, but now, at the moment of truth, he faltered and betrayed us. What is your verdict? True death! You think back on the years gone by, all the difficult decisions you had to make, all the actions that led you to this moment. Your destiny has been fulfilled. Could you have chosen differently? Fire! A thunderous volley of gunshot rings in your ears. You head towards a blinding light. Power plus to reign of terror. Order minus two. True death. The end is of the massacre. The event has happened. The revolt led by Sophia wins at the cost of Ramantha's massacre. True death. Event has happened. Your earthly life is over. You leave the world forever and face the judgment of the twins. Fire and blood engulfed the streets of Anisote before spreading to the rest of the Empire. So this is the first time I actually heard them say the name of the city. It's Anizote. I thought it was just Anizot. Outcome of the revolt. It took only a few days for the entire empire to learn of the revolt and the events that had transpired in Anizote. The unthinkable victory of the common folk over the war engine, that was the Imperial Legion. The ruthless and fearsome leaders of the rebellion, the terrifying slaughter of the nobles, priests, and anyone 
else who stood in the insurgents' way. By the end of the second day, the revolt has reduced the city of Anizu to charred, smoldering ruin. Thick, acrid smoke from burning buildings and gunpowder blanketed the city. Bodies swung from ropes on every street. The results of the justice of the people's court, sprawled, abandoned, blood-riddled corpses, could be found in every square. The events of those days entered the annals of history as the Great Anizot Massacre. But the rebels were not content. Having purged all their enemies from Anizote, they immediately began to march across the province. Every town and village in their way was freed from the noble rule. As the landowners fought in terror, the commoners abandoned their homes and armed themselves to fight beneath the banner of the last straw. The rebel army grew larger and stronger by the day. So began their bloody campaign of destruction. Wherever the rebels march, the old ways of the empire collapse. They have no mercy, leaving nothing behind but smoldering ruin and the ashes of the dead. Age-old traditions burn as their ravenous flames consume town after town, city after city. This is horrifying. The old noble dynasties are amassing their own armies beneath the banner of the Tempest to fight off this chaos. But the rebel hordes are already approaching the capital. There is no stopping them. Sophia's dream of waging war against the old world has begun. Regardless of the outcome, the empire will never be the same. The bloodthirsty march of the rebellion obliterated any semblance of the rule of law in Magra. Loastro and his followers massacred all the old rulers, leaving chaos and anarchy in their wake. It was only inevitable that the province would fall into the hands of outlaws and marauders. The old ways are gone, but can the people of Magra build something new in their place? Church. The clash between the old faith and the new continued. As the schism in the clergy grew, the people of Magra remained similarly divided. Neither doctrine has enough power to prevail over the other, so the venomous accusations and fervent disputes continue. The Inquisition is powerless to end the struggle. The strife between the faiths will continue to fester. The people of the province and the empire will never be at peace until they decide which path of worship is the one that leads to the twins. Wealth of Magra The farmers, miners and tradesmen of Magra managed to survive the years of unrest. Once those dark days were behind them, they quickly recovered. The fields filled with imported soil continued to supply the people with food, and the migrant silver mines maintained a steady flow of the blessed metal to the rest of the empire. Whatever happens next, the province is safe from poverty and hunger. Order The years of unrest have left a mark on Mangra. People no longer fear or respect the rule of law. This order continues to spread throughout the land. The only thing capable of maintaining an unsteady balance is brute force, as carnage, riots, and disdain for the law continue to plague the province. It will be a long time before Magra has a chance at peace again. Divine Omens For many years after the revolt in Anizoti, the people of the Empire told the tale of how the Elder Twin himself visited the mortal world once again. He donned the guise of a common mortal to see the truth of his own creation and settle a dispute with the younger, but no one helped him find the answer he sought. What? And so, as the legend goes, the elder twin returned to the shining pillar, never to descend to the mortal realm again. Was Nathan the elder... elder twin? What became of Dorius Autumn? Until the very end, the Arcanian commander refused to acknowledge that the laws that governed the lower world held sway over him as well. And yet, thanks to you, he finally faced the justice. The once renowned descendant of the Autumn dynasty met an ignoble end on the gallows, a terrible blow from which his family never recovered. With the death of its last living son, the venerable autumn blood tide ran dry. What became of Augustine? When Prefect Augustine Alborn saw first hand the atrocities being committed on the streets of Anizot, 
He did what he could to urge the people to stop Sophia and her henchmen by any means necessary, but he was too late. In the end, Alborn shared the same fate as the last row's other enemies. The former judge faced death with dignity, showing no fear before the rebel's muskets. His face expressed only deep, bitter sorrow. He ended the same way as we did. Sir Elborn is remembered as one of the ringleaders of the Anisut massacre and the Bloodthirsty Rebellion that poised the entire empire. He did not deserve that. He became a father one earth. Ebert Leonard has had hoped to become the first patriarch elected by the people, but this was not meant to be. The leader of the new faith met his end beneath the ruins of the very temple that he had been entrusted into his care. He is remembered as a priest who provoked the wrath of the twins themselves and reduced the empire's greatest holy place to rubble. What became of Thomas? By the time the revolt had set Anizoti in place, a blaze, not in place. By the time the revolt has set Anisati ablaze, Thomas Guerrero was already living a new life with his family far from the city. It seemed as though he could finally enjoy a peaceful life. But a few months later, the rebellion reached the sleepy village where your friend and his wife had put down roots. A horde of rebels approached the village where they lived, and most of the villagers joined them, eager to loot and pillage their very own community. Thomas fought desperately for his wife and livelihood, but he was torn limb from limb by his former neighbors. <sighs> what became of Octavia? The creature that was once Octavia Melanidas left this world forever, but it honored your request and left something behind. Years later, new followers of the Latari began to emerge throughout the Empire forming new circles in which to study their strange teachings and seek a way out of the world the twins had created. One by one they discovered scraps of knowledge scattered across the empire, but only you knew where this knowledge has originated. Despite the persecution they suffered throughout the empire, the followers of the Latari refused to abandon their teachings. The Latari have returned to the world. What became of Sophia? Ever since she was young, Sophia had been the living embodiment of hatred, the spawn of every hideous injustice committed in the Empire. She prevailed in struggle for Aniso, and that victory finally revealed her true power. New Sophia cast her shadow over every corner of the Empire, her eyes blazing with yellow flame, eager to incinerate every army and province in her path. No one can stop Sophia and defeat her bloodthirsty hordes. After the victor in Anisoti, the inveterate rebel began a brutal war against the old order, a war that had seemed utterly unthinkable just a few years ago. A war of annihilation. Sophia is remembered as the woman who destroyed the blessed Arcanian Empire and burned the old world to the ground. What became of the Bronte family? Thanks to your efforts, the Bronte family escaped Anisoti with their wives just before the rebellion reached its apex. But there would be no return to the rebellious city. The family home was burned to the ground by a rioting mob, and their old wife was lost along with it. The Brontes never picked a side in the battle for Anisot, and in the end, they were rejected by both factions. Now the family must roam the empire, looking for a new place to take shelter. Left without a home, influence or friends, the Brontes have fallen on hard times, but they are ready to face the future bravely as long as they have each other. What became of Robert Brontë? Your father was his status, his career and his home. The rebellion destroyed Robert Brontë's life and gave him nothing in return. When the world changed, your father found himself unable to adapt and find a new place in it. He had no choice but to abandon his ambition and live in obscurity. His family was all he had left, so he dedicated himself to caring for its well-being. But that's not bad. At least it looks like, you know, our family is doing okay. What became of Lydia? Your mother passed away from illness long before these events transpired. 
My dear Bronte was not there to see what became of her family. What became of Stefan? Stefan never accepted the new order. Frustrated by your decision and the success of the revolt, he was not ready to come to terms with a free Anizati that had stripped him of his noble privileges. Yet he never became your enemy despite the growing distance between you. He did, however, choose to leave his home, city, never to return. Stefan moved to the capital and worked hard to pursue a military career and find a place in the emperor's court. For many long years, your elder brother lived alone, far from the rest of you, yet he still carried the Bronte name and never stopped writing letters back home. Stefan was too plain spoken to survive the intrigue and never ending power struggles in the capital. His bold and ambitious nature swiftly earned him a plethora of enemies. Before long, he was falsely accused of plotting against the crown. However, Stefan found the strength to reach out to your father for help. A man equally skilled at courtroom arguments and backroom diplomacy, Robert intervened just in time to save his son from execution. Stefan was quick to take advantage of his enemy's unrivaled plots. When the false accusations crumbled, he used them as a stepping stone for his own career. In a matter of years, your elder brother became the supreme commander of the Imperial Legion. He never saw the faces of his loved ones again, but his family remained in his heart for the rest of his life. This seems weirdly disjointed from the rest of uh, rest of the fates, if we call them that. What became of Gloria? Gloria's new wife as a nobleman's wife put an end to her youthful ardor. When she moved to her husband's home, her fervent poetry and her struggle in the name of the common folk remained in the past. She languished in her newfound monotony at first, mourning her fate, but the connection to the Bronte family remained. Through this surviving link, Gloria found the strength to overcome her alienation and pull herself out of the depths of melancholy in which she was mired. Slowly but surely, she came to recognize and accept the genuine love of Sir José El Pelletier in time, she responded to a selfless and cordial care with deep gratitude. Yes, we did good. Gloria eventually came to terms with her newfound wife in the noble estate, far from the city. She soon gave birth to the first of, the, of their children and dedicated herself to raising the heir of the great El Palatier bloodline. And so Gloria spent the rest of her life far from the turmoil in Anizoti, Surrounded by comfort and warmth until the end of her days. Yes, 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 yes. What became of Nathan? Dazed by the changes brought by the rebellion, Nathan Bronte found himself completely lost in the world around him. As the burden of his past sins grew more and more unbearable, he retreated into his own mind until not even his own family could reach him. In the end, his despair drove him away from the family home. He roamed Magra as a vagabond, devoid of all purpose. Nathan Vanton was squandered the rest of his lives one by one in meaningless fights. He died his true death in a drunken brawl in a filthy roadhouse somewhere on the outskirts of Magra. What became of Gregor Bronte? Not even the afterwife. Not even in the afterlife did Gregor Bronte see the realization of his great dream. His descendants failed to have the Bronte name ennobled by the sword. The Bronte bloodline was denied its chance to become one of the empire's most eminent dynasties. The blood tide ushered in by, George, by Gregor Bronte would never have another chance at immortality. What became of you? You have made your last and most important choice. Was your death worth it? Could you have chosen a different path? Either way, there is no going back. Your fate is sealed. There is no returning from the hereafter. And so you bid farewell to your mortal life. Everything you fought for, everything you strove for, all that is behind you now. You are on your way to the shining pillar to evade the judgment of the twins. You can no longer change the world's destiny, but the choices you made and the deeds you did have left an indelible mark. The world will remember the life and suffering of Rudolf Brandt. True death. The hour of your death has come. Your soul has left your body, never to return. You are taken to the peak of the shining pillar. Every moment separates you more and more from the mortal realm. 
The ring that once bound you to it is gone forever. You look up to see two divine visages watching you intently. The older twin gazes upon you, full of sorrow and compassion. The younger examines you dispassionately, seeing your every act and thought. You have ascended from the mortal realm. From here, you are but one step away from partaking in eternal bliss atop the peak of the shining pillar. But first you must be judged by them, just as every other soul born in this world has been judged since time immemorial. Only the judgment can decide whether you deserve to remain atop the peak or be hurled down to the foot. You stand before the twins. Your very essence is laid bare before them, all the secrets of your inner self revealed in full. Your soul is like an open book to them, one that preserves the story of your entire life. You lie prostrate before the gods. The time has come to take responsibility for your mortal life. And the elder twin asks, are you thankful to the gods for the lives you lived? You are calm. You start to accept everything that happened to you in the world that once created. Your wife was your wife. They hear you answer. Compassion and remorse fills the immeasurable deep eyes of the elder twin. He turns his face. He turns to face his divine brother, who returns his gaze with an expression of stern remorse. The elder twin asks once more, "What was your wife to you?" Service. We spend it in service to others. The other twin bows his head warily, considering your response. But the stern visage of the younger brother already looms above you. Human by the name of Bronte, what did you live for? For a cause. We yearned to do a great deed that would outlive us, and by that we mean justice for all. The younger's gaze lingers on your bare, defenseless soul. The divine figure continues its stern interrogation. What did you leave behind? A change. I blaze the trail for change that will go out with me. The younger twin now moves towards you with queer intent, poised to render his judgment, but the elder twin restrains his brother with a gesture. A divine voice fills you once again. Did your wife make the world we made better and more perfect? It became worse. We left the mortal world in a far more terrible place than it was before. The younger twin is silent, his eyes two swords piercing her soul. The other twin speaks to you again. But you already know the question, the very same question that caused you so much suffering shortly before your true and final death. What determined your destiny? We did. The twin gods exchange a glance that lasts a brief moment, an all eternity. Then the hand of the other twin reaches out to you, and glowing with light and warmth. The gods offer you an unprecedented opportunity to change our destiny, to rewrite the book of our life. Would you like to take a different path in life? No, our life is over and we will face whatever awaits us with no regrets. You reject the hand of the elder. The immense divine silhouette withdraws in sorrow. The younger twins step forward, leaving you to face his law alone. The twins' judgment is nearing its end. The soul of a man named Bronte lies prostrate at your feet. You have witnessed his entire life, know his every act, seen his every thought and desire. No other soul could ever walk the same path. So many difficult choices, so many emotions, so much pain. Another soul awaits your judgment. You know no mercy, nor does young brother. Every mortal must walk the path chosen for him to the very end. Those who abide by the precepts set forth by you and your brother shall return to you and become a part of you. Those who reject you shall know the eternal suffering of oblivion. Where does the man Rudolf Bronte belong? The Peak of the Pillar You gingerly grasp the fragile soul, lift it up and turn to face your elder brother. You lift your sword. Your brother stands with arms akimbo, ready for the blow. 
The blade slices through his chest, binding light gushes from the gash. You bring the minuscule soul to your brother's chest and it dissolves in the streams of shimmering luminescence. A tiny fragment of your shark creation has rejoined the whole. The man named Branta is no more. There is only the eternal fount in which he now abides. The Chronicle of Life of Rudolf Branta. Ah, okay. So we need to let it run. So we're gonna do another review for what happened. Damn, this is a long game. So we were born in the year 1118. Our life began anew. Four years later, Nathan was born and our brother and sister had their sacrament. We started the fencing lessons and we died for the first time. Was that? <laughs> that was by our own grandfather, wasn't it? Then we had the insight. Grandmother returned. Yeah. The next year we had the sacrament. We met Thomas, and we saved Sophia. That's interesting because that's that's probably the one thing that I regret the most in this playthrough, that I saved that raging lunatic. She would still be there, but we sacrificed one of our lives for a woman that destroyed everything around us eventually. Matters of the heart. We experienced our first romantic feelings. School begins, year 1131, Stefan's disgrace, Nathan's admonition and revelation of the tree. 1142, blood tide, grandfather's demise, departure from home. Arrival to the capital, bond of friendship, path of the nobleman. Year 1146, Iowa's rescue. I wonder who I was is. Homecoming. In 1147, and graduating from the college. 1148, began service at the prefecture. We became the protector of the people and gave our promise to our born. Then had an affair with Octavia and deal with Egmont. We started to deal with the Autumn's case, evidence against Autumn. But our family was branded by dishonor the same year we betrothed Gloria. Thomas started his new life in 1144. Gloria got married, and our mother has died, and Octavia was transformed. In 1145, we had often sentenced. And then, at the start of the next year, we became the rebel. The Amazon massacre happened, we managed to save our family, and we died. <laughs> 